Welcome to the Comm Center with Drew Breezy. I'm your host, Drew Breezy. PTSD 911 is a documentary about mental health struggles of first responders. It was made by an award-winning filmmaker by the name of Conrad Weaver. Conrad's an advocate for first responders. He has a particularly sizable passion for the plight of the ordinary humans who have to deal with the extraordinary things that uh, society brings us every day. The film has drawn praise and acclaim from professionals in the police, firefighter, paramedic, 911 dispatcher, military, and mental health professions. We're going to talk to Conrad today about the movie, what inspired him to do it, and how it's creating the conversation then that's been ignored for far, far too long. All that and what it means for your weekend on the Comm Center. City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Wake up, America. It's the Comm Center with Drew Breezy, where we tell 911 tales and talk cop response. I'm John. I'm an active 911 dispatcher in the field. Our host for tonight is Andrew Baxter, also called Drew Breezy. He's a 29-year veteran of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, former dispatcher, a cop, detective, and all the good things we love. Drew, it's been a while since I talked to you, about a, a week. How are you doing, bud? Uh, I'm doing better now that I've, uh, I'm able to talk to you, John. You always calm me down. You have a very calming sense. Yeah, I don't. I don't know where I've been lately. Uh, you know, back uh, when we started the show almost a year ago, there was quite a bit more tension. And I, I miss the. I miss how daily you would call me and wake me up at insane hours to scream at me, and uh, it's, it just hasn't been the same since then. I agree. I think we need to get back to that, um, so I can just you know burn off some of the, whatever the the bad stuff. Yeah, you got to put it on me. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Conrad Weaver. We just mentioned some of his uh, credentials and the things that he's working on, but he and Drew go back uh, farther than I do uh, as far as their relationship. So, yeah, Drew, I, uh, why don't you just introduce your friend? And I, I, I just I just gave the brief intro. This was uh, the my VIP uh, entrance pass to the uh, to the premiere that was a, a little over a year ago. I can't believe it's been a year. Conrad, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. It's it's great to be here. Great to be alive. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. It's hard to believe that November third a year ago was already been a year. It's crazy. It was a it was a great premiere and a great movie. We're gonna uh, show you a um, a trailer for it later, but. Uh, why don't you give us a talk a little bit about yourself, Conrad? To do a little bragging on yourself. You <laughs> rarely do that. Well, I am a filmmaker. I'm a podcast host. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a grandfather. And, and some people think I should be Santa Claus this year. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was all those things. I'm also a, a an avid bike rider. Uh, we can talk about this later, but I rode a bicycle across the country this summer and and in support of my film and, and kind of a promotional tour. But yeah, I'm a filmmaker, a storyteller. Uh, I like telling stories that matter. I've been uh, producing documentaries now since about 2012. I produce a, my, my first feature length documentary was actually in the, in the agriculture world. It's called The Great American Wheat Harvest. I was on a plane one time and I told this guy this and he said, weed harvest, what's this? I said, no, wheat, wheat, as in the stuff that you make bread with. <laughs> Should have told so, him you make, uh, you could make uh, whiskey with it too. Yeah, there you, you, you also have a couple podcasts. Did you want to mention those? I do, yeah. It's a, uh, a podcast that comes out of the film, PTSD 911. It's, it's kind of continuing the conversation with first responder leaders from around the world. Uh, kind of talking about wellness and about what it takes to develop a wellness culture within an organism. And so that podcast is ongoing every Wednesday. And so- What was uh, the name one more time? It's just called the First Responder Wellness Podcast. It's available anywhere you listen to podcasts. And uh, some places I don't even, I was, I was Googling it the other day to make sure, see, see where it's at. And it's like, wow, it's on that channel? I didn't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's out there. So uh, then I also host the upcoming, soon to be launched- Coffee with Conrad podcast, and this is deeper conversations about life, purpose, success, and adventure. 
And so uh, these are interviews I have with people that I've met along the way, some interesting people, some semi-celebrities, and some other people that I've met, had the opportunity to run into along the way. And so that podcast, we're, we're doing interviews right now, and we're launching that in January. And so uh, excited to launch that show. And so, yeah, I just, I love telling stories. I loved going on adventures. And uh, right now I'm eyeball deep into First Responders and uh, this important film that I've produced and really excited to talk about it. Yeah, ho hopefully I'm not the first one to do this. I mean, I I'm hardly qualified being a retired First Responder to be able to uh, let you into the First Responder Hall of Fame. But <laughs> um, uh, so hopefully somebody has at this point, but Man, you, you're you're de most definitely an honorary first responder. I, I can tell you, I'm looking forward to the coffee with Conrad, uh, you know, uh, concept because and there's a lot of alliteration there. But um, because, folks, if you don't like, when he released PTSD 911, which is a brilliant film, by the way. I mean, it's it touches it, it tackles a very hard subject, but it's it's so well shot and it's just it's just, I, I mean, it evokes the right emotions at the right times, and I think it appeals to the right leadership that um you know because I, I i think i think mental health is kind of a buzzword that uh that some leaders in in uh the first responder profession today can use to kind of make it look like they care uh, but not all of them care a lot of right. them do but the the movie evokes a lot of that but what he did was brilliant he he took uh he and his friend who communicates via sign language which is pretty cool uh cycled from one side of the united states to the other and they stopped in all these places and did a premiere like you know they'd stop at a, a church or a firehouse or whatever and got the first responders together and did a did a premiere of the show like a free showing or however it worked out mm -hmm. it's a great journey to watch on his instagram i mean you know it, it kind of filled up my uh my summer i mm -hmm. guess it would be it obviously filled up yours uh, so tell me a little bit about, uh, coast to coast. Yeah. Coast to coast came out of a desire to, that I've had for probably 20 years to ride a bicycle across the country. I know it's a crazy thing. I've had some friends over the years that have done it. And during COVID, as we all were, you know, sequestered in our homes and, you know, kind of locked up, we started watching YouTube and I found this YouTuber by the name of Ryan Van Duzer. And he lives in Boulder, Colorado. He doesn't even own a car. He bicycles everywhere. He's also an ultra marathon runner. He runs these hundred mile marathons, which is insane. Yeah. And so we started following him and in part of his channel, he was taking a bike trip across the country, coast to coast. And I was like, wow, okay, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. It's time to do this. I have a documentary coming out. What if we okay, there's first responders in every community in, in the country. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what if I ride a bicycle across the country and stop in cities along the way and meet with first responders and show the film? And I was like, I, I talked to my wife and she said, yeah, that, that sounds crazy, but yeah, okay, I'll support that. I have to have her support because, you know, I'll be gone for sure. nine, you know, nine weeks. She's the boss. And then, yeah, and then I went to my friend John and I said, hey, John, you want to go on a bike ride? And I ended there and he goes, sure, where are we going? I go, well, how about Oregon to Maryland? He goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just in the process of retiring from a government job. And he looked at me and he was like, he looked over at his wife and he was like, I'm in, let's do it. <laughs> and it was that easy. And so we were like, okay, how, how, how are we going to do this? So it's expensive and we need bicycles and we need training and all the stuff. So we ended up, uh, getting an amazing sponsor and a bike sponsor priority bicycles and actually ryan van duzer the youtuber that i mentioned i reached out to him had him on my podcast at the time and then he connected us to his sponsor priority bicycles who then said what do you need and we were like uh bikes and they said well we got that covered what else do you need <laughs> and so it was that easy Bar priority bicycles a premier bike company a little boutique bike company out of manhattan new york they gave us two priority 600 bicycles about 2500 hour bicycle and off we were and then so we started training and you know the biggest part of training isn't isn't your legs as one may think it's your behind Ooh, oh right yeah spending you know, eight hours in the bike saddle every day can be quite painful. And so, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, no, actually, I can't imagine. 
Like I'm yeah. sitting in a comfortable <laughs> office chair and I, I'm yeah. having pain. So that's what we did. We started training. We trained. We started, you know, in the spring, as soon as the, we were able to get outside and ride. We live in Maryland. So we get outside and ride. We we started with like 10 miles a week. And then we went to 20 and then we went to 30. And by the end of our training, by mid-April, we, we rode 100 miles in one day. And I wanted to do that so I can just prove to myself that, okay, I can do this. And so we did. One day we went out and rode 100 miles, 4,500 feet of elevation gain, I think, that day. Mm, wow. So a lot of hills. Um, and so we were ready. And then we got a sponsorship from uh, Lighthouse Health and Wellness. They're a mobile app for first responders. And they were also the primary sponsor for the, the PTSD documentary. And so Lighthouse came on and said, hey, we want to support you. And three weeks before we left, I get a call from Joe from Lighthouse. He goes, Conrad, I did a thing. Like, okay, what? I bought an RV. I'm coming with you. <laughs> We're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Because we didn't ha expect to have support. And so yeah. we had a full-on support crew with an RV tracking with us they were always within a couple hours of us oh you know, i was gonna say they weren't just like driving right behind you were they? no they weren't driving right behind they did that a couple times when we had some bridges to go over but uh otherwise they were within a couple hours of us there was a couple times they had to duck out for family things or business things they had to go to attend in fact they ducked out during the hardest part of the ride which was Oof. during the mountains uh yeah. during our ride through yellowstone they wow. ducked out for a week and so we had to like carry all of our gear with us, but we were fine. We, by that time, we were finely tuned bicycle riders. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing adventure. Uh, we stopped at and stayed at firehouses along the way, a few places, uh, met with first responders. We had 14 events across the country, uh, some extremely well uh, attended, others not so much, but uh, it, every event was amazing in its own way. And it really raised awareness for this film. And we, well, yeah, we met some amazing people. Yeah, obviously raising awareness for the film is one thing. But I, I, like, if you're anything like me, um, <clears throat> you probably have the empathy gene <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that tells you, like when I was running a, a communication center and something major happened in there, I, I could feel the energy. I could, mm -hmm. I could feel the vibe and I would almost absorb the pain, you know, basically of, of what they were absorbing. Um, and I, I would do my best, you know, to, to use every, every resource I had to make sure that they were well taken care of. But at the end of the day, that took its toll on me. So I'm not firsthand experiencing the trauma, but I'm experiencing the trauma they're experiencing through vicariously through them. Sure. So I can see where you making this film and the heaviness that's involved. And, you know, th there aren't, this isn't like um, completely just sad stories or whatever, but right. it, it's it's very very heavy. So I mean, this may have been an opportunity to clear your head after uh, probably about a year and a half or two years Absolutely. of filming. And actually, it it's kind of cleared my head after about four years of working in films that were really dark. Right. Uh, my previous film was called Heroin's Grip story about the opioid crisis. And so I spent time with families who lost their kids. I spent time with, with people addicted to heroin and other drugs. And, and so it was really dark. And, and so for four, five years, I spent, you know, working on these films and telling these stories and, 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 and meeting these people. And so that was part of the reason for the ride. It was just to get out, to see the country slow, to clear my head. And that absolutely happened. And I learned so much. Uh, so a little spoiler alert, I'm also, I'm working on a book that's going to come out sometime, maybe next year, hopefully that's based on the ride. And so, um, uh, I learned so much about myself. I learned one of the main things I learned and that we'll talk about in the book is I learned to be present. Mm. Uh, you know, so we are so distracted by our phones, by bells and whistles, by everything around us. And we're not present. In fact, Jerry Seinfeld has a little shtick he does about, you know, we don't want to be anywhere. You know, if we're at home, we're thinking about being on the golf course. If we're on the golf course, we're thinking about being done, being, you know, at the bar or whatever. If we're at work, we're obviously not thinking, we're wanting to get out of there. We're not wanting to be anywhere. And so, which is very true. Well, yeah. I had to, we had, you know, so, so John and I on our ride, we had to learn to be present because there was two of us. So 
the one in front was always looking ahead to see, to make sure that there wasn't any broken beer bottles on the side of the road or other obstacles that would impede our journey. The one in the back was aware of what was coming behind us, whether it was a semi truck, which almost knocked me off the road a couple of times. Wow. Uh, you know, other vehicles, you know, distracted drivers, that kind of thing. So we had to be very aware of our situation and to be present, to be, you know, we couldn't just be daydreaming, which we did sometimes in those areas of the country that there was nothing. That's you where know, I live. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, we rode across Wyoming the one day, well, it took a couple of days, but uh, the, the one day for, for sure, we were in the middle of literally nowhere, central Wyoming. There's no houses, there's no trees, there's no farms, there's nothing for miles and miles and miles. And it was, it was just liberating. It was amazing. I love and that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was one of those places where I just wanted to be there and just to be, just to experience the, the the quiet. Yeah, you know, all you could hear was the wind. Yeah, uh, there wasn't I, even a jet overhead. You know, it was just beautiful. <laughs> right. I I took a trip through central Nevada once. We were we were in a car, so it was a road trip. But I mean, when we got out, I mean. The, the things you hear in the silence is amazing. And Nevada is one of those those states that's so big, it, it's so vast, and the mountains are so huge, you know, even in a car, let alone on a bike. But you'll be you'll be looking at a range or a particular mountain for hours and hours yeah. and hours. And on a bike, you're lo looking at it all day. You know, right. you see the same mountain all day. It changes shape a little bit as you ride, but yeah. you see it all day because, you know, we're, we were averaging about 61 miles. Um, you know, in a day. And so you could, you could literally see the same mountain all day as you're riding, yeah. you know, on certain parts of, you know, of the journey. So it sounds amazing. Yeah, it, it, it was fantastic. Amazing. Highly recommend. It's also a great weight loss program. Yeah. program. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> uh, so. I've unfortunately gained probably most of my weight back, but uh, it, it did. And it helped me kind of grow out the, the beard. The beard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing journey, not only personally, but just the people I've met along the way, we'd roll into a town, go into a restaurant, sit at the bar, have a dinner. The lady, we were in Iowa. I remember this one place that happened and, and the lady was like, what are you guys doing? And we were, we told her and uh, we went to pay the bill and she goes, it's on the house. Nice. You know, we, we had that over and over again. We, we rolled into one firehouse in, uh, uh, in Idaho and we just rolled in unannounced. Here we are. And they were like, what are you guys doing for dinner? And we were like, don't have any plans. We've been smoking a brisket. I was like, what time's dinner? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so things like that happened over and over again. We stayed, I remember staying at a firehouse in Des Moines, Iowa. They put us up in the captain's room and the lieutenant's room, you know, and we stayed overnight. And, and I think they had one call that night, which we were pretty lucky as not to get you know, waking day was it kind of in the suburbs. So they were like, if you were downtown, man, you'd be up all night. Yeah. So, uh, so we got to experience the firehouse life and, uh, and did that several places. We rolled into one town in Washington state. It was a little volunteer fire station and the chief just happened to be there. And he was like, what do you guys need? We're like, well, a place to sleep. And he goes, we got a room in the back. We're like, perfect. And so, you know, it was just that kind of hospitality. Uh, that we've met all along the way. It was just fantastic. Uh, got to meet the chief of the, the fire chief in Columbus, Ohio on July cool. 3rd. We were downtown Columbus for the big party down there and got to be in a parade uh, on, on July 4th. And uh, did you get to ride on a truck or did they make you ride your bike in the parade? No, we, say, we right? actually rode the bike. It was, it <laughs> oh. was the, it was a re really quirky wonky parade called a doodah parade. <laughs> It's a politically correct, politically incorrect uh, satire parade. Where oh, okay. So you saw all kinds of weird stuff. Oh. We were probably the most normal thing in the parade, <laughs> if you can imagine. Yeah. And, uh, but we were like, and anybody could join the parade. So we we're like, hey, John, anybody could be the parade. Let's go do it. <laughs> right, yeah. we're in. So we did. We rode we the go. parade. So it was, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, all those kind of events, you know, then it, across Ohio, we rode bike paths a lot. Ohio has amazing bike paths. Uh, and then came into Pennsylvania and rode on the, on the Gap Trail, which is the Great Allegheny Passage Trail. It's an old rail trail. Yep. And then goes over the mountains and then goes down to the CNO Canal Trail, which then goes all the way to Washington. We, we ducked out probably about 100 miles east or, or west of Washington and went up to Emmitsburg, Maryland, which is where I'm from. 
If you're in the fire service, you've always heard of you've heard of Emmitsburg. It's the home of the National Fire Academy, National Emergency Training Center, the National Fallen Firefighter Memorial is here. It's where I live. And we were able to stop here for a night. We actually had six rest days uh, along the way, and at home was one of the rest days. And from here, then we went over to over the over the north side of the Chesapeake Bay, and all the way down to Ocean City, Maryland. And so that was the journey. It was uh, fantastic, and and just you know, it really brought awareness of the film. It helped us connect to first responders. Um, uh, you know, you know, and so it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us. And I'm ready to do it again. How it's, long did it, how long did it take? It was 65 days. Yeah. Oh, nine, wow. weeks, nine weeks and two days. So it wasn't wow. straight, uh, like you had a day of rest in between generally. We, about it? every 10 days we took a day off. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And it was funny because even on those days off, we were like, oh, you know what? I wish we'd be riding. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know so. Is it like you, being on a boat? Do you feel like you're pedaling when you're just walking down the street? Sometimes, you know, it was funny. We were, we were, we stopped in Missoula, Montana, and that was one of our rest days. And so it's a beautiful town. If you've ever, ever been there, it's just a yeah. fantastic area. Yep. And we were going down, we had to get some, some parts for the bike, uh, some spokes that were broken. And so we were walking downtown and John kept looking to his left like this. And I was like, what are you doing? He's you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm on the bike. I'm looking at the mirror. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as we were walking, we still kind of had some of those habits of, you know, because you're so used to riding the bike, you're always checking the mirror, always checking the mirror. And yeah. we started doing that when we were walking. It was pretty funny. That's funny. That's quite a, quite a contrast that um, the worst in society that brings out the worst in first responders actually beget this you, you know, you being able to see the best in society and the best of, of what people have to offer. And, and it just, it probably gives you a whole different look on, on yeah, humanity. You know, it does. Guess. It does. And, and, you know, my friend Ryan Van Duzer, the YouTuber that I mentioned earlier, he had said this several times on his show that, you know, he said, I pedal across the country and there's everywhere there's people that they want to help. They want to reach out. They're, they're just kind and loving. Yeah, occasionally you'll meet, you know, what we call, I don't know if you can swear on the show, but okay. occasionally occasionally we meet assholes. And we yeah. had an asshole rating for for cars that wouldn't go over. And so, if, oh, he was a he was a, about a four on the scale. <laughs> and some, some of the trucks were tens, you know, on the asshole yep. scale. And, but so we made some of those along the way. But it's so true. What the news media puts out there is just death and doom and gloom that everyone's bad everyone's evil there's no good in the world well that's a lie yeah, it is you know there's everywhere you go there's amazing people that's, people that are willing to help people that are willing yeah. to smile and just you know lend a hand and it's so it yeah it's it's amazing well that's the difference in perspective between going out and being among them and then just looking at a, at a tv in your house and having someone tell you what the world is you know go Absolutely. see it for yourself Absolutely. And, you know, even, even Doozer, as he's called, you know, he's been to Mexico and some other like really gnarly places, you know, on his bicycle. And he said, it's fine. Yeah. There's places you don't want to go. You got to be smart. You know, uh, like in Mexico, he was told, you know, don't go in this area because that's where the cartels are and they're having a war right now. Yeah. So, okay. It's probably not best, probably best not to go there, but generally people are, are great. People are helpful and and want to do good we had you know i think we had two people out of the whole 65 days we had two people that shot us the bird wow <laughs> two out of hundreds out of thousands that we met For and those two know, were, it could have been the same person so well <laughs> it could have been because it was both they were both the same day <laughs> in nebraska of all places. <laughs> well, yeah, we you know, know tumble, rough and tumble Nebraska. We Nebraska, hear, you know, <laughs> Nebraska's a little different, uh, you know. <laughs> well, that, that was their motto. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a marketing firm who came up with a slogan for Nebraska and it actually, they actually ad adopted it. it. It said Nebraska. It's not for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> that it's, was their motto. I, it's completely true. <laughs> and it is I, true. But I guess you know, we the, know what the, the state bird of uh, Nebraska is. And... <laughs> there's also a thing called Nebraska Nice. And, you know, yeah, we saw a lot of that. But, you know, these two guys that thought, you know, in, in fact, one of them was like, we were on a four lane going, you know, east. And this guy was in the far lane going west, yelling out the window, telling us to get the F off the road. And we're like, 
dude, we're not even in your lane. You know, what's your yeah, problem? I, I, you know, road, road rage is just how most people uh, kind of uh, have their catharsis. Why pay for therapy when you could just yell at somebody on a bike? And, and I think it, it shows a little bit of the mental state of people today, you know? And, and yeah, sometimes that if I wouldn't be in a good place, I'd probably have road rage too occasionally, you know? Uh, but that's something that, you know, we learned that, okay, yeah, there are people out there who don't think you should be on the road and there's people who don't like cyclists and I get that. And sometimes there are cyclists who, you know, are assholes themselves. Uh, you know, and we met a few of those along the way, yeah. but, uh, for the most part, people are wonderful. Yeah. John, if you want to ask a question, I'm going to try, we're recording this so we can edit it out, but I'm going to try to fix this internet issue I'm having. So how did you get into to filmmaking? You know, that's to, to do it and do it well is not something that you just stumble into. It's not something you really have luck with. You know, you've got to learn things about lighting and how to frame a shot and cinematography. And there's a whole technology aspect of it. Like, how did, how did you get started with that and what was helpful for you? Yeah, so I grew up with a camera in my hand uh, taking photos. Uh, my first photo was an Argus 35 millimeter camera that I just learned how to take photos. And so framing was always, I have an eye for it. Um, but I never thought about making it a career. When I was in college, and I studied psychology in college, uh, I ended up working part-time for the college newspaper as a photographer, ended up being the head photographer for the newspaper. Uh, so I was skilled at framing, I was skilled at capturing photos, things like that, but I never got into video until much later in life. And uh, I had a couple of video cameras over the years, you know, taking family stuff and things like that, but it never wasn't really a passion of mine. And then I went to work, ironically, for a church, and we started doing video at this church. And the pastor one day was like, hey, let's let's make a video for the service. And so they leaned on me to do it, and I went out and figured it out. Mm -hmm. And we started doing that on a regular basis. So I thought, you know what, I should probably go take a class. So yeah. I found a local organization who was giving classes. And so I went took a class on shooting, on lighting, uh, on editing, and got some skills that way. And then just dove into it and learned, because uh, we were, you know, you know, Sunday comes every week at a church. And so yeah. you're producing stuff every week. So I got good at it fast. And pretty soon uh, people in the church would saw my work and it was high quality. And I started getting hired to do side projects. In fact, yeah. the very first gig I had outside my day job was at the 2005 presidential inauguration. I was hired by a security firm to do a behind the scenes mini documentary about the security at the inauguration. So I had, I had a secret service credentials to all access to the presidential balls, all access to the parade route. And I spent all day on the parade route and it was in the presidential balls when it was his George W. Bush uh, was, was being inaugurated, I think his second inaugural. His second one, yeah. And so I was in the room with him, you know, when he was, he and Laura were dancing on the stage and shooting all that. And, and I was like, Hey, I can, this is fun. I could make some extra money on the side doing these side gigs. And pretty soon that grew till I had a full on company and I couldn't, you know, have two jobs. And so I left my job at the church and went full time. And doesn't then, doesn't hurt having the president in your portfolio, you know, when you're sh when you're showing that to a uh, prospective people who want to hire you. Oh yeah, I did a true, little, true I did a little yeah. gig with uh, George and Laura here a little bit ago. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that 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 helps. Then I also got hired by uh, if you're a baseball fan, you know the name Greg Maddox. Sure. Uh, Greg Maddox Foundation hired me to produce some work for them. Uh, he did an annual charity golf tournament in Las Vegas. And so every year for six years, I flew out to Vegas and shot some video for them and produced some stuff uh, for them. So that was fun. Got to meet a bunch of people, a bunch of, you know, sports celebrities and a few, few Hollywood folks, but uh, nothing, nothing huge there. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun just to hang out with those people and you find out what they know. Um, but yeah, it kind of gave me some credibility. I did some work for the government, uh, NIH hired me to do a project at Fort Detrick here locally. And, and then this con this idea of a documentary popped up and literally I have to, I have to credit my wife because she it was her idea. We were, I was reading a blog, uh, about these, these wheat harvesters who live in their RVs. They travel across the country every summer harvesting wheat. And I was reading this blog. And my wife was like, she looked over my shoulder one day and she's like, you should make a movie about that. Hmm. I go, 
that's a great idea. <laughs> and two years later, three years later, we had a film. And that's that awesome. film won a regional Emmy Award. Um, and that's been still my very first and my favorite documentary because it's my first. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot from that film. Uh, we you know, got to, then from there, I went to produce a documentary about the drought in the American West called Thirsty Land. And uh, then those two films took me away from home for weeks at a time. And so I started looking for projects locally and the opioid crisis uh, was really bad at the time here locally. And so uh, a local friend, uh, kind of a, a well-known person in the community, her son got involved and was in, in prison for dealing drugs. And so we we produced a documentary called Heroin's Grip. And so uh, how long ago was Heroin's Grip, grip by the way? Like, that, when did you start filming that? We started filming that in 2016, I think. Okay, so t 2016, we're in 2023, and that's what, seven years, John? I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm bad at that. Yeah, it's hard to know. So, yep. so think about <laughs> seven straight years of this quote opioid crisis. I mean, you know, it's it's called it's rebranded as the fentanyl crisis now. I mean, yeah, I, I understand right. that there's fentanyl in just about every street Everything. drug there yep. is, but um, we've been dealing with this for for quite a while. And heroin's grip is not just um, you know this is what tears people apart. It's not just the political argument of do we close the border or do you know mm -hmm. all these other things that people talk about. Um, this, this takes its toll on, it, it obviously rips apart the, the pro probably, you know, some of the mo more prominent families, it sure. rips apart the lowest income people. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it really gets the first responders <laughs> involved yeah. because it, it's, it's like a, it's an uphill climb. It's a, it, it's a daily battle. When, when I was on the street a couple of years ago, a shift commander, we had, we set a record with a guy. We narcan him three times. Wow. So, so we narcan him. He went to like the in ER, one day. came home, overdosed mm. again, like within the same shift. Like they just kept letting him out, obviously. And then he'd go home and he'd be all mad. So he'd just finish whatever he had. And then we'd narcan him again and take him to the wow. hospital. And, you know, so it, that's going to take its toll on the first responders. So in, in your film, in heroin's grip, I remember you had uh, Desiree Palmer in in there, yep. if I remember mm -hmm. right. She was one yep. of the officers there, and she was, you know, she's affected by this this crisis, which bled into PTSD nine one one. The the thing I like about PTSD nine one one the most is that you had representation from law enforcement, being mm -hmm. Desiree. Uh, Maddie Fiorenza, uh, who uh, I met, Fireman Maddie, I think he's, he goes by yep. on uh, Instagram. I met mm -hmm. him and Axel at the at the uh, premiere. Super mm -hmm. nice guy. Uh, super vulnerable in the movie. I mean, it's it's just stuff that you need to experience to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Dan uh, Dan Jarvis, the 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 twenty two uh, zero guy, the uh, former deputy sheriff here in Florida, but he was also in the military and he kind of represented the the first responder aspect of that. I, I have a funny story about him too, also, by the way. And then, you know, our beloved Nicole Ford, who was a mm -hmm. dispatcher, just like John is just like I was and uh, a long time ago. And, um, you know, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about Desiree first. We definitely sure. want to talk more about, uh, Nicole. Yeah. I was connected with Desiree in heroin's grip. Uh, there was a friend who knew her and knew that her sister was a full on heroin user and had been for many, many years. And so it, they said that, well, you know, Desiree, she really has compassion for people who use heroin and, and, and drug use. Uh, and she treats them like real human beings, you know? And so I reached out to the chief and the chief gave me permission for me to do ride alongs with her. And so I spent time with her, uh, you know, on patrol in some of the worst parts of Frederick. I mean, Frederick's not a huge town, but it's it's the second largest city in Maryland. Uh, it has, you know, a pretty, pr pretty, you know, it re robust uh, uh, drug use problem in the city. And so her beat was kind of that area. And so the one day we were on patrol and dispatch came over and said, hey, there's an overdose. And which is kind of what I wanted to here i mean not that i want an overdose but i want to be there if there is one and so you know lights and sirens and we're off to the races and we are, we arrive and it's a fatal overdose oh no and it's someone that 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 uh she knew oh. and had dealt with before and uh 30 some year old woman is a scene that i wasn't used to seeing 
Yeah. Um, but the officers, you know, including Desiree and the medics on scene were like, it's just Tuesday. Yeah, it's just, it just is. a day. You yeah. Know? And so that got me thinking, okay, what, what, you're reacting in a way that's way different than I reacted to this. Yeah. So why? You know, what, what, you know, you know, how are you, how are you impacted by these scenes? And so I asked Desiree that and she was like, well, if you want to make a movie about that, I'll do anything I can to help you. Yeah. And not realizing she'd become one of the main characters in PTSD 901. And so that led me into doing the research and, you know, okay, finding out more about this thing and, and finding out what PTS is and what PTSD is and the difference between those two. Um, uh, and how it impacts first responders. You know, you know, a lot of people that I talk to around the country, when you say PTSD, the first thing they think about is, is the military, and rightly so. Uh, it's been a huge issue, and it still is. It will be an issue forever. Anytime there's a war, there's going to be PTSD. You know, that, that's just the nature of being human. Uh, but very few people think about first responders. And what first responders experience, including dispatch and the call takers who are in the call centers, um, they experience things that no one should experience and they see things that no one should see, but they do. And they do it willingly. They, they show up, you call at two 45 in the morning, they will show up, they will be there, take care of our emergencies, no matter what. And they carry the weight of those experiences on their shoulders. And so many are deeply impacted by it. And, you know, not only, are they impacted by the traumas that they experience through the work and the responses that they have, but they're also traumatized, I think, sometimes and sometimes more deeply by administrators oh, I know who that. don't care <laughs> uh, or, or, or systems that don't work right. Uh, there's a whole there's a whole documentary out there that couldn't be produced about workman's comp and the issues there, you know, yeah. and there's there's so many problems with that whole system that our first responders aren't taken care of in many in many places and historically you know it's been the story of if you have a problem give me your badge give me your gun yeah uh take a break you know yep. and that's so which people, is morally defeating for those people in that situation because that's what they're trying to avoid and they derive so much you know purpose from their identity being sewn up in their work that you take right. that away from them they have no more identity Absolutely. Once you say take a break, it's the same thing as destroying them. This yeah. Was the and then, so what you're going to do, you're not going to say anything, right? Right. Okay. I'm Keep having a drinking problem. Life, I'm not right. going to say anything because I'm going to lose my job. So mm -hmm. now you have people who are unwell serving yeah. right. and responding to horrible situations. And they're, they're responding to things. And I, and I, and I can guarantee that's why some of these things have happened that have shown up on the evening news. Oh, if some of these no people doubt. would have been healthy, they would have been a different response. Yeah, I have no doubt about that. It's yeah. I've I've heard many tales in some other podcasts, but also just watching the trailer for yours, which we can go ahead and probably insert at this time. But you you look at that, and you know she's saying, you know, I've I've got just a few years left to retirement. I have to be okay. You know, they 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 endure the the most terrible emotional battles of their of their lives and their career and, and they don't have any choice but to hang on and that just adds to their desperation. I went to a really dark place in my mind where suicide became an option. I was going through a divorce. I had lost a lot of relationships with people and I wasn't, I was isolating. While I was trying to heal from the traumas that had put me in the position that I was in, I suddenly lost all the support of all the guys I worked with. Yeah, shots fired. Shots fired on both roof. About 15 minutes in, I'm just listening, and all you can hear is just people screaming. I was only two years into my career with Boston at this point. I was so hypervigilant, and, and I couldn't shut my brain off. I remember the moment I was like, okay, I was up all night, it was just trauma after trauma after trauma. You know, the novelty of the job wore off really quick. I couldn't think of how to get help without ruining my job. There's a stigma in the profession that creates a barrier, a stigma in their agencies that prevents them from getting the help they need. I didn't have somebody to talk to. I didn't have somebody that understood. 
there was a part of me that said, okay, pick up the phone, call this person. This is how you're gonna get yourself out of this skillfully and safely. I look back at that period of my life and, and I just felt so completely, utterly isolated. Now my ego wants to stop me from doing that. It wants to tell me, um, you got this. You don't need to let anybody know that this is going on. And that's why I didn't know where to turn and I didn't, I beat myself up because I thought I am such a mess and I'm the only one. I have four years till retirement and I gotta be okay and I gotta make it. Right now our profession is, is being challenged. We're going through a really, really difficult season. Uh, there's no time like the president where officer wellness has to be your number one priority. We have to do a better job as leadership in our profession to understand that, that that is what we're dealing with people. And I think it's really important that that is our number one resource and that it has to be our number one priority moving forward if we want to change this profession. We're just coming into our second year now of really teaching structured training in wellness, mental health to the um, firefighter academy. Okay, I'm open to trying something different. If you told me, me four years ago or three years ago I was doing yoga, I'd have laughed in your face. If I could plant seeds throughout the state of wellness, it'll get out there and start permeating and changing the culture. And it's so much better when you have really amazing people in your life that you can walk through this stuff with. You don't have to do it alone. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely don't want to put uh, Desiree's business out on the street, but I, I, I think it was documented in the documentary itself. She, she asked for help. She, she said, mm -hmm. I, I can't do this. Like, I can't keep it compartmentalized anymore. And what was the administrator's response to that? I mean, they, they, they took her off the street and take her off the street, go get help. But, By the way, it's on your own dime. It's mm -hmm. on your own dime. And, and we're not going to let you back in until you, you can prove to us that you're fine. And yeah. you're never going to be fine again, by the way. Yeah, well, so, even even then, if she found complete healing, too, you know, what do her own partners think about her for ha having right. to take time off? And it's not going to be a secret, no matter how confidential things are in an HR office or things like that. People mm -hmm. will know. And then, you know, when you're depending on someone for your, for your life because you do the same uh, dangerous job, you know, you're going to get treated different or with kid gloves or you're not going to be counted on. You're no longer an equal amongst peers. And it's yeah. that's devastating to your image, too, is that, you know, I, I I have healed or I am healing, but I'll still never be the same cop that I was. Yeah. And do do your your fellow your workmates, you know, if you're in law enforcement, do you do they trust you? Right. That you're going to be there to back them up when right. when shit happens, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Nicole is a, is a whole separate uh, uh, topic. Nicole was a dispatcher during the Boston bombings. Uh, yeah. She was, uh, I think, Boston PD or, or what? Yeah, she was Boston PD. Right. Um, she, As a civilian, she wasn't. She wasn't uniform. She was civilian. Right. We mm -hmm. we we did a, um, uh, a a nice. Well, it's hard to call it nice. We, we did a tribute to Nicole mm -hmm. way back when uh, when the when the, the, the look. It's hard to even talk about. Yeah. Nicole took her own life, and yeah. and she was a dispatcher. She could just never shake the ghosts that uh, haunt. And and I think it's completely overlooked the the dispatchers because uh, the call takers and and the people on the radio, the, the trauma is the exact same. This is what people don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. you know, even even when we talk about Desiree and and her going to a scene to see yet another overdose. It's not necessarily the blood and guts that's making everybody kind of, um, you know, compartmentalize or, or, or want to shut everything out. It's the, the screams of the mother or it's the yeah. cries of the people around you. or yeah. And you, you can't shake that. You, you, I'll you never forget that. With I'll never forget that scream. Yeah, never... it's a, like that wail. Yeah. And, and yeah. so when you're a dispatch, when you're a 911 call taker and you have no warning, the, the tones mm. come into your ears and you hear that wail, it's an old familiar wail. Uh, screaming, crying, whatever, or you're you're party to somebody's suicide, or mm. you're party to somebody's murder. For God's sakes, it's the same trauma. The only difference is the acute danger. The the, right, the firemen right. and the and paramedics and the police officers are in acute danger because of what they're experiencing out on the street. But the the trauma is the exact same. 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, I know it that manifests you, in the same way. It right. It, 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 it ha- right, right. So it turn it leads to, uh, you know, bad habits, drinking, yeah. sedentary lifestyle, maybe, you, you know, so when I was, this is a controversial subject, I, I think. Um, and, and I, I definitely want to give Nicole some time in a second here, but when I was getting ready to take over a communication center, uh, for my agency, I was selected to do it. And the joke, you know, first of all, the joke was, uh, well, what did you do wrong? Hmm. And, and I, I always found it to be an honor anyway. I, I couldn't give a fuck less what, every, what anyone thinks of, uh, whether that was a punishment or not. I, I, that was an honor and I still carry that honor to this day. I, I still, uh, communicate with a lot of those people that are in there. Um, but, but, but the point being, um, they, they're just, so when I was getting ready to, uh, take this over, some of the other jokes I heard were, okay, well, are you going to change the, the, uh, soda machine to only diet Cokes? Because they're, the, you know, it's such a funny thing that, you know, they're overweight or it, there's a lot of obesity in a communications environment. But nobody's looking at the four walls that they can't leave. Hmm. And nobody's looking at the fact that they're burying like years of the, the mm-hmm. accumulation of trauma and all this other stuff with sugary. You got to get your dopamine hit somehow. Stress eating is exactly what it is. I it's see it every eating. day. Right, right now there's a box full of candy at my comm center. Yeah, you're, you're not going to you're not going to sit there and eat carrot sticks. And, and it just it's not going to work. So I took that personal as in. Look, I got a little weight problem myself, but I mean, I took that personal as in, look, this is the best you guys got. Like, you're going to take little cheap shots at their weight or, or, or why isn't anybody asking why they're like that? Because I can tell you when I started in that same communication center 25 years prior, it was the exact same. We were all kind of overweight. Everybody was cranky with one another. And if you ever go down a PTSD checklist, I can check off every single mm. symptom when I was a dispatcher, when I was a cop. I can check off all of the the symptoms I see with some of the call takers that were working on the floor at the time. And, and you know, we still have an administration, or we had at the time, that, that was uh, draconian. They, they wanted to punish their way out of these situations. Mm. And somebody has the balls to tell me that we need to put Diet Coke in the Coke machine or, or don't send pizzas up there, or whatever their stupid little jokes are. Yeah. So, um, you want to know what, why we're hostile? It's because we're hearing things like that. It's just, no, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not true. professional it, courtesy. We don't talk yeah. that way about police officers. It's not human. It, it's inhumane. And, 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 so, and so, how many times did you send, uh, the, the shitty calls to those people? Oh, yeah. They, that's, <laughs> that's the, right. That's the I won't, only. I won't say anything about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the only, you know, the only revenge, the only form of revenge. So, God rest her soul, Nicole uh, obviously mm-hmm. wasn't able to shake whatever demons yeah. uh, came her way. And I know that you were, um, I, I know that she was probably, you were probably fairly close with her. And yeah. uh, I, I know that you went to her celebration of life up there in New England. So mm-hmm. um, if you want to talk a little bit about Nicole. I yeah, think. Nicole, you know, we found Nicole through a friend uh, in the 911 community who's who's part of the Nina organization. And uh, this lady out of uh, Kansas reached out and she said, hey, I, I've got someone for you. If you haven't found anyone in 911, I have someone that you might be interested in talking to. And her name is Nicole Ford. And so... As we did, I forwarded that to my co-producer, Nancy, who then set up a Zoom call with Nicole. And she called me right after that. She said, Conrad, we, we've got our 911 person right here. Nicole has an amazing story. She's well-spoken. She's she's excited and enthusiastic about doing this. Um, and so, yeah, so I went up to Boston. I spent a couple of days with her. Uh, she was, the, at the time, working for Chelsea, the uh, the it's a suburb of Boston. Uh, the the uh, uh, Chelsea Police Department was a actually a, a supervisor in the 911 center there, and uh, it was uh, just a few uh, weeks or months after we were there. She ended up moving to South Dakota, kind of a change of life and kind of kind of shifting you know, some things. But while we were there, we were able to go uh, down to the scene uh, of where the Boston Marathon bombing happened. And kind of do some filming there, and then we went out to a scene where she was involved in handling a uh, a police involved shooting that one of their detectives got uh, got ambushed, mm. and uh, she was the primary uh, dispatcher on that call, and really ended up winning or receiving a a, a commendation from the police commissioner, uh, and I think Mark Wahlberg was there, I think to 
to give her that that that, that award. Uh, but anyway, she had never been to that scene of that shooting, uh, like the physical street address. So we went there, and we were standing there, and she said, "I I totally imagined this totally different, you know, in my head of how this looked." And while we were standing there, and she was trying to absorb all this what she was experiencing and the thoughts she was going through and, and, you know, the memories of that day of dispatching all those things. She suddenly stopped. She said, Oh my goodness. She said, tomorrow's the anniversary of this. Wow. Ooh. And it, I was like, wow, are you okay? She said, yeah, I, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. But she was able to process that. And it was, and I think it was a, it was a, it was a really moving time for her to be there and to, to realize that yeah, right here's where this happened six years ago, you know, and when she was in the call center and, but you know, this was happening right here on the street. And so it was a really moving thing. Then she moved to South Dakota and had a change of life and some things going on. So, uh, the summer of 20, what is this? 23, 22, summer of 22. I went out to South Dakota, spent a couple of days out there with her, uh, in her new life. And she had just lost her job at the call center because she had had COVID and uh, we, we, we describe all this stuff in the film and, and lost her job. And, and that was devastating to her. Uh, and then a few weeks after I was out there, she messaged me and she said, she's moving back to Maine, back to her, where her family's at. And uh, it was uh, October, it was August 3rd that I got the notification actually a few days after that. Uh, and ironically, it was through a, a cryptic message on our YouTube channel that just simply said, RIP Nicole. I was like, what the heck? That's a, probably the worst way to find out. Yeah. Well, so I, I picked up the phone and I sent her a text and I said, Nicole, uh, I just wanted to check on you, make sure you're doing okay. And about an hour later, I get a call from her mother. And she told me the story and, uh, it was devastating. It was a punch in the teeth. It was just, it was, uh, like, here's someone in my film, you know, she had been to the premiere. She had been to, had just that, uh, in April had been to an event in Wisconsin where she, the, the, the folks there at this film festival wanted her there and she was there speaking about her story, uh, making a difference. And now this. And, uh, so, you know, the family wanted me to come up and spend time with them and attend the, the celebration of life, which I did. I was honored to do that. Um, and, go ahead. Uh, and it was two weeks later, we had a screening event planned in Pennsylvania. I was like, how the heck do I get through this? Mm. And so I reached out to, um, uh, to Jim Marshall with the 911 training Institute. And he was, he was an advisor on the film and, uh, we had been in contact several times and he actually set me up with a, uh, a world renowned suicidologist who I spent about 45 minutes on the phone with this gentleman, just talking through, okay, how do we process this? How do we share this information, you know, at a screening event, um, uh, you know, here's someone in the film and now they're not with us. How do we talk about that? And, and, uh, so I was able to do that at that first screening event in Pennsylvania. And as we wrapped up, uh, a gentleman came up to me afterwards and he said, I just want you to know that Nicole saved my life. I was like, really tell me about that. He said, well, she was on a podcast a few years ago and I heard her story and it inspired me to go get help and it saved my life. So Nicole saved my life. And this, that just, a few minutes later, I was able to send a text message to her family back in Maine. I said, this is what people are saying. You know, Nicole's story matters. Her life matters, still does, will continue to matter, and will continue to make an impact everywhere this film is shown. It will continue to make an impact and impact lives and save lives because of her willingness to get help even in the end when she was not able to ask for help, she was willing to get help at one point mm -hmm. and it did save her life until it didn't. Right. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, I take comfort in the fact that Nicole's story matters. 
Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, so exponentially she's saving, you know what I mean? How many, listen, we thousands, talk about thousands the, of people have seen this film and yeah, are going to see it. And, 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 <laughs> I, and, I, I, and she'll inspire other 911 dispatchers who need to get help to get that help so that they can, they can continue on in a life of helping people. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Th- think of also like her standing there processing at the scene on the anniversary or the eve of the anniversary mm-hmm. and um, just how dispatchers, 911 dispatchers or call takers or radio people who work the radio, they just, they never get closure. Mm-hmm. They, she had never seen the scene. Yeah. So, yeah. so when you're a first responder and you go out somewhere and you see a, a, a nasty car wreck or a bloody scene or whatever, at least, you know, you can go home and have nightmares about that because you have a visual, mm-hmm. but Nicole and, and others like her and John, um, have to fill in those blanks. And sometimes those, they never get to completely process that. And I think that that's completely overlooked. So thank God, um, you know, she can, she has this legacy. She has this, yeah. this, uh, vehicle to, and, and I, I guarantee it's exponential. It, it's, it's yeah, showing that. Yeah. We're hoping there's a, there's a legislation right now on Capitol Hill. I think it's called the 911 saves act. Yes, and, yes. uh, it's, it's, I forget where I'm not sure where it's at, you know, in the process, but <laughs> we are really wishing to get her name attached to that bill. Oh, man. Uh, it would be a huge thing. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'm hoping to see her family. Uh, they just bought tickets for our event in New York uh, coming up on th- this week. And so uh, I'm hoping to see them and reconnecting. We're actually working on a, a main event uh, up in Augusta, Maine. We're going to do a screening event up there and her family's helping to to organize that and to, to put that together. And so, uh, uh, you know, as everywhere we go, we tell her story. My message is, you know, it just gives me the motivation to reach out one more time. You know, if you know someone's struggling, or even if they may appear to be not struggling, reach out, ask, hey, how are you doing? And don't answer fine, because that's a four letter word. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I've used it before. I know right. what that means. <laughs> Haven't we all, right? Uh, you know, but reach out. There are some people like Nicole in her final days was not able to reach out, you know, and so it comes becomes our responsibility to reach in and to reach out to these folks who, you know, just need a connection, just need to know that one more person cares, that one person is thinking about them. Because what does that do? I mean, when this happened and then the word spread quickly around the country that of her passing, I got dozens of text messages from people, Conrad, how are you doing? Yeah. Just checking on me to see, to make sure. And I know how that made me feel. Yeah. It's like, wow, they see me, you know? And I think we need to be in our, in our society that is so disconnected. We have the ability to be very connected, you know? You know, when we want to be. I know, yeah. I know quite a few people in the counseling field uh, who do different things, whether it's through the church or professionally. And they tell me, you know, they, the people that they talk to, there's so many people out there that need counseling, but there's so many people in their office or talking to them who don't need counseling. What they just need is a friend. Yeah. You know, we're, we're more disconnected than ever, probably because it's easier than ever to be connected with each other. And we don't yeah. put in that time and effort and energy to have that human contact. And so now people are out there suffering and they're hurting and all the things that all the all the grieves the grievous things and, and terrible things in life that bring a person down anyway they're magnified in our time and yeah. we have to find a way to take time to to be a good friend to others because that's something that we all need it's something we all need and yet we don't give it to each other for some reason yeah that's true um, and it doesn't take any time at all just to send a quick text message or a voicemail to someone to say hey i'm thinking about you today and not even to ask the question how are you but just saying hey i see you yeah right you know you're in my thoughts today yeah, mm-hmm. and that can make make a that can make a matter of life and death for someone that's on the brink. It can it can definitely uh, take away those uh, abject feelings of despair and hopelessness and insignificance and meaninglessness, and just to know that you that you're a part of someone's day, whether you see them or not. Just right. someone's thinking of you that you matter. Your your presence matters, and so your absence would matter by the same token. And it goes back to, you know, on my bicycle trip to being present. 
right. you know, to being present in each other's life and to, and to let people know that you're present. You know, how many times have we been out to dinner and you see families sitting at a table and every single one of them is on their phone? Yeah. They're not present. All the time. I'm very guilty yeah. of it. And, and I, as am I, as am I. And we've, we've really made an effort to not do that. Uh, but I've been guilty of that. But it just reminds me that we need to be present in each other's lives, even though even we, though we may be miles apart, we can still be present. And we can let the other person know that we are present and we, that they are thought of. And sometimes a, th a simple gesture like that can be the spark that can lead someone in, in the right direction to a healthier place. And I think that's what we all need. Speaking very of, well said. Speaking of uh, heading in the right direction, are, are you seeing um, at least greater... Uh, are you seeing progress? Are you le at least seeing greater conversations or longer conversations, at least from the right people, uh, as you kind of you know tour the country with the film? Yeah, I am. I'm I'm seeing uh, the movement in the right direction. The needle is starting to move in the right direction for sure. Uh, I mean, there are still pockets of places where it's like "suck it up, here's a beer," you know yeah. that mentality. Yeah. Uh, but that is less and less uh, because I think mental health as a whole has been you know, front and center for a, a while now, even on the national news. Um, and I, so I think it's these conversations are starting to happen more and more. And that's what we're really encouraging this film to get to, to for agencies to purchase the film, to use in-house so that it can have that conversation. It, it gives them a platform to say, hey, we need to have this conversation. And it opens the door for that conversation to say, hey, it's all right for us to talk about this. Uh, I was talking with our local fire chief here just on Sunday. I, I ran into him at a local event, and and he said that's happening. And he's a he's a fire chief here locally. It's a volunteer station, but he's a lieutenant in another agency uh, in another state. And he said that's happening in his agency, where the conversation is now okay. Uh, yeah, we need to do something about this. It's a conversation we have to have. We can't just you know suck it up. Here's a beer anymore because that's obviously led us down a wrong path. Uh, and I was really encouraged last week. I had, uh, had a fire captain from a suburb of Dallas on my, on my podcast and, and his agency, he went to his city leaders. He put together a proposal and went to his city leaders and said, Hey, we need a line item in the budget for wellness for our firefighters. And he got an approval and they, they said, we crafted this thing. So they pretty much couldn't say no. No, oh. and they, they the small agency of eighty firefighters. Yeah. Uh, he said, I, "I said, well, how much of the budget is that line item?" He said, "It's fifteen thousand dollars." And what that does, he said, we pay for any mental health service that any of our firefighters need. If they need to go see a therapist, it's paid for. If they need to go to thirty day treatment, it's paid for. He said, now sometimes we have to raise some extra money to help cover some things, but it's a 100% paid for. He said, we have a waiting list for people to come work for our agency because they've heard that we take care of our own, that we help you. That's all anybody wants is acknowledgement. Why I shouldn't that be the standard? Anybody. Yeah, right. It's just, it's a, it's acknowledgement. Like, it's the comfort of knowing you're going to have a job if you have to leave because something traumatic happened to you. Yep. I, 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 you know, we've had this conversation before, John and I, about uh, I, I'm completely tired of hearing, you know, this is what you signed up for. And, and I understand the concept, this is what you signed up for. This is something that may occur in your career it doesn't mean that you're you're supposed to just endure it because your brain's not just like we said at the beginning of the conversation you your brain is not you're seeing things that your brain's not programmed to see yeah so uh just to be seen i don't think is a big ask mm -hmm. and you know like workers comp is a whole different issue obviously but um I, i'm glad to see that at least uh, agencies, if it's by the agency or by the municipality or by the state, even um, they're starting to recognize, you know, the importance of including everybody. It's in, and, and listen, you, you'll never, you'll never outshout me when I tell you that <laughs> first, res uh, that dispatchers are first responders. You will yeah. never, ever outshout Absolutely. me. I, 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 until the last breath I take. I will tell you that they're 1000% first responders. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm encouraged. There's, we've even had some state agencies. Uh, in fact, just 
a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the DOJ, Department of Justice, in the state of Wisconsin bought the film for the entire state. Oh, wow. And so they were, they were able to put it on their intranet, and so their people can access the film and use it in their training sessions. And so we're seeing some of that movement. We're seeing you know statewide organizations that are saying, hey, we need to have these conversations. I had a guy on last week from the state of Ohio who is the head of wellness for, he actually works directly for the, uh, the state troopers, but they service every first responder agency in the state of Ohio for mental health. And they've made it a priority. They've actually established an office for this, have a budget for this. And he's a leader. He travels all over the state, taking care of first responders from fire, police, dispatch, EMS, and even state uh, state connected military organizations there. And so we're seeing more and more things like that happen where where there are funds in place to take care of first responders on a statewide level. And I think that needs to grow, needs to, and even the state of Utah, I heard, if you are a retired firefighter, police officer, dispatcher, if you are a public safety professional and retire and want to go back and get your master's in counseling, the state will pay for it. That's amazing. Like, that's amazing. That's what we I, need. I mean, that's who, who's going to connect better than a, uh, than a retired. Yeah, I mean, exactly. because that's that's another that's a whole separate issue that I discovered when I was researching the topic. That um, if you if you end up with the wrong therapist or the wrong mental <laughs> health professional, it has the opposite effect. It can be devastating. Yeah, it, it'll be like you and, will, and not only for you, you as the anyone. first responder, it can be devastating for the mental health professional. Yes, because yeah. I've heard of that. I've heard of a mental health professional taking their own life. Yeah. yeah. After it, in a counseling session with a with a first responder. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that just to just to say we talk about police officers, firefighters, uh, dispatchers not going out there and getting help because of the negative impact that it can have in your career. It's exactly the same thing for mental health professionals if they're feeling depressed or suicidal or whatever. That's they you know who do they have to talk to? You know if if they if they are in serious trouble, they're going to report it to their therapist mm -hmm. or their mental health supervisor. They're gonna they're gonna be treated like a regular person. They're gonna get the the you know twenty four hour involuntary committal or whatever's going on with them, and it could be devastating for their job. So they're just deeper down the same line of everything that affects us in terms of our profession and mental health. Yeah, you know one thing at our at our screening events, we, we usually do a Q and A at the end, and I often have professionals on the stage, whether they're first responders or they're mental health professionals. And my closing question to these group, to, to these folks is always this, and I'm gonna ask you guys this question. Okay, what do you do to take care of yourself and your mental health? <laughs> I, uh, I started a podcast and a YouTube channel <laughs> called The Comm Center with Drew Breezy, where I, uh, uh, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm half joking. Um, advocacy is where it's at, in my opinion, like, uh, I, I, I went into that profession. I went into communications or, or you know, 911 emergency communications with childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And I built upon that. And I didn't know what it was. And, and, I, and, and so I suffered through it and made it to the police academy, made it through the police academy rather, and then built a whole new set of skills to, to you know, uh, compartmentalize my traumas and and uh, was exposed to even more new trauma so uh, to me the the therapeutic part of this is exposing it like being able to explain it in a way that just anybody will understand it not just first responders not just um, dispatchers but just like my brother or, or you know just some curious woman in seattle that just wants mm. to know and wants to help first responders or whatever uh that's what i do for wellness i get it out of me i i, mm. I do my best to help and and you know sometimes it's a a risk because i i take a lot of phone calls sometimes where i'm i'm talking people off the i mean you know my mm -hmm. phone's not ringing off the hook or anything but i take plenty of phone calls where I, i've got to talk some sense into people but mm -hmm. that's an honor in my opinion i i'm i'm coming I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, as somebody who's been suicidal, when you're calling me for help or you're you're asking me what do I do or uh, that's what I do to to yeah I mean I help to help others you know it, I think it probably comes you know from the from my uh, recovery uh, my alcohol recovery also just you know helping others is is mm -hmm. what's going to get you through John sure. what, what's your what's your path. 
Well, I got a couple, but I would just want to piggyback to say being able to come on the show and talk about what I do and be treated as though I, I have some authority and that I know what I'm talking about has been huge for me. I, you know, I just spent the last 48 hours in, in a comment section on a YouTube page where someone was trying to tell me I don't know anything about being a 911 dispatcher, you know, and I, and I let them get my goat. But I've spent the last you know, almost year on the show talking about what I do. And I've had people reach out to me. You know, I got to talk to a dispatcher from Texas last week. I've talked to dispatchers. So. California and all over. And I've actually had more than one of them and even police officers thanking me for my leadership. I'm just like, you, you think of me as a leader because I talk about this stuff. That's huge. It, you know, in my personal life, I, I like to exercise, I like to take care of myself. Uh, faith is a huge part of it for me. If you're a person of faith, then you believe that everything that you do is really, you're really working for God. And, and then the suffering that you're taking part in is all for something. So that's a huge part. It helps me uh, to have that connectivity to the, to the rest of the world and understanding that what I'm doing actually matters more than than when I'm in that moment and I'm super frustrated with this call or I'm really angry at this police officer. I kind of pump the brakes and I, I, I give it, I can give myself some bigger context. So it's been very helpful to talk about things. But, you know, if you're not somebody of faith or if you, can, you don't have the energy to start a podcast for yourself, <laughs> uh, making sure you're devoting yourself to the things that you love. The first thing that depression takes away from you is time spent doing the things that you love, whether that's right. being outside, whether that's bicycling, uh, whatever that is, spending time with family, you have to kind of push yourself or find someone who's going to pull you in the direction of doing those things and remind yourself of who you are as a person outside of the job and spending spending time being present doing that, not just spending a life working in a career, making a living, but being alive. You have to find a way to do that. And creativity, your passions, whatever those are, as, as long as they're positive and constructive things, you need to lean into those. So, Conrad, I, I, I just I want to commend you for the film. First of all, again, you're you're in the first responder hall of fame. I just created it, and I, and I, I don't know where it exists, but we're <laughs> we're going to make it. And you're probably the first uh, inductee. Uh, secondly, um, uh, I I admire the fact, and for those that are wondering, wherever the film is shown, when Conrad's involved, he has mental health professionals there. So if you're triggered or or if you're just not feeling right or you just like make a commitment at that point that you need to fix your life mm -hmm. you can step out into the lobby and somebody will be there to talk to you which i think is very very commendable because it's it's something that people probably don't think about when you're watching these things and uh uh you know john and i had had an experience the other day where we're just talking casually about like people dying or whatever and and it's hard to uh it's hard to translate that into the civilian world where you can just casually talk about that and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and even joke about it at times. And, you know, I mean, it just comes across so callous, but mm -hmm. that's just, that's kind of where we are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just being in the first responder for prof profession. So uh, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, if you could give us your Instagram website, YouTube, how we can get a hold of you. And, and by the way, I'm making a commitment right now. If it's open, if it's open to the public, I'm coming to Augusta for the showing of that. Uh, for oh, wow. we, I yeah. mean, if it's open. Uh, yeah, and, it, and, it will be open to the public for sure. Okay. And yeah. I am officially inviting John because for accountability purposes, he always says that he's not invited. <laughs> I will pay for him to fly <laughs> wherever he's from. If not, I will make sure I'll put the fix in because I know you're you're doing a bike giveaway on Thursday night. I'll put the fix yep. in to get him a bike and he can ride <laughs> to Augusta. But uh, where can we find you, Conrad? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty easy. It's uh, just at PTSD 911 movie, all one word. PTSD 911 movie on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, even on YouTube, you can find us there. Uh, or if you go to the website, PTSD 911 movie.com uh, is the website, uh, you can find us there. And uh, if you want to host a screening in your city, uh, there's a form on the website you can fill out and we'll get back to you, fill that form out and I'll get back to you personally. And we'll start working on uh, putting events together. Yeah, this week will be in New York City, uh, our New York premiere. We're excited about that and uh, excited about uh, bringing people together to show this film. And uh, soon I'll be announcing this in January on the podcast, but I will announce where the film will be available publicly to the general public. Awesome. I get so, that question all the time, believe it or not. Yep, it will be coming soon. So, um, John, before you close us out... Um, I, 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 I just, again, for accountability purposes, I've been trying like hell to get this thing to Tampa. I mean, I, I wanted it. We, we, we had spoken 
months back and it was you know we were looking towards september i wanted to do a two-nighter kind of thing like <laughs> here in sarasota then my mother passed away and there was just th th just life got in the way mm -hmm. uh so i'm gonna do everything in my power to get this thing to tampa somehow Let's do it. some Let's way do it. i'll be in we'll... sarasota next week actually seeing my oh, mom that's awesome. just a quick trip so yeah. all right uh john can you how about you close us out my friend well before we go i just wanted to play a voicemail it's a tradition on this show that we talk to people live or we play their voicemails we encourage you to call us and leave a voicemail if you want to be part of the comp center with drew drew breezy that number is 848-COM-911 that's 848-2666-911 you can call us and you can talk to us live when we have live episodes or you can leave us a voicemail with that in mind i'm going to go ahead and play a voicemail left behind to us uh by jim who is a friend of Drew. It's the only one for the week, so it's a light week for voicemails, but go ahead and send us a message. We always like getting them. Here we go. John and Drew, this is Jim from Florida calling, catching you on your new uh, your new channel. Keep up the good work. John's doing a better job than Drew. Of course. Thank you. I always appreciate being the tip of your spear right into the side of Drew. I appreciate that. Uh, folks, if you like the Cobb Center, we are in New Digs. You can follow us on Spotify. Make sure you leave a five-star rating review. If you're looking at us on YouTube, make sure you click follow. Hit that notification bell so you can keep up with the Cobb Center. Also, you can find Drew Breezy at uh, What Say Drew is this new Instagram handle. You can find me if you want to at Difficult to Look at Pictures. And finally, Conrad, uh, did you want to leave your socials and where they can find you? Sure. They can find me. Uh, my Instagram for my personal site is Conrad Weaver. And uh, my, my business name is Conjo Studios, C-O-N-J-O-S-T-U-D-I-O-S. And uh, of course, PTSD 911 movie is all things PTSD 911. And shout out for the podcast, the First Responder Wellness Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts. And it's also available on YouTube. So First Responder Wellness Podcast. So Make check sure it out. And I really appreciate you guys having me on the show. It's been uh, an we honor. appreciate you being here. You're, I, you're I welcome. Welcome here anytime. Thank you. And I just want to say, Drew, thank you. Drew was one of our sponsors for the film. He was a supporter and a big time supporter of the film. So I really appreciate that, Drew. Anytime. All right. Well, we'll see you back here uh, every week. Thanks for subscribing and watching and listening to the Comm Center. We'll see you. Take care.